Welcome to Wildlife at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo. I'm Dr. Larry Kilmar, the zoo director. And I'm with Ashley and Megan today in our macaw training facility. Now, you just saw the macaw flyover, and the staff here spends countless hours training these birds for this particular flyover. We're the only ones, uh, uh, we are the ones that started this flyover in Florida, and they fly about a third of a mile from this facility up to the front of the zoo. And Ashley, uh, this has been a, a long drawn out process because you have to take very small steps uh, in the training process. So just briefly explain how you started this training. It, it does take a long time. The training is very intense. We use small approximations or small steps every single day, and we work on their flight strength. So this right here is our flight run. So this is where they start learning. So what they do is they actually will go into the flight run and we'll just work on A to Bs or flying from one person to another, and that way they get the strength built up. And then once we go outside, we'll just go from perch to perch, small little steps every single day, just going a little bit further. Okay, so an A to B is, is from one point to the other, right? Yes. Okay, so obviously when you have a free flight uh, flyover like this, you're going to have some fly-offs. That's going to occur, and, and it really takes the patience of the staff to not overreact to this situation. Of course, these big, bright, colorful birds are easy to find uh, in our trees, so that's usually not a problem. But interesting, it's really the food and, and your relationship with the birds that they want to come back, right? Yes, indeed. We actually have a really good relationship with our birds. We hand-raised all of them, so they're really used to being around people, and we taught them how to fly. So positive reinforcement, a lot of treats, a lot of fruit and vegetables and parrot pellets and nuts always gets them coming back. So when like you that. said we trained, <laughs> trained them as, they came in as chicks, right? How old were they when, when we started? When they came in, they were about, I think, about eight weeks old. Okay. So they still had their little baby feathers on their baby plumage, and then after time, they just started growing their new adult feathers in, and we were hand feeding them and just helping them. So they, they ought to obviously associate you with food and with care. Uh, this is an interesting, it's like, wait a minute, I don't want to come down there, that microphone's scary. Uh, so they associate you with food and with care, and that's that bond that you create from the chick. Uh, age, correct? Exactly. Uh, parrots are actually very social birds. So when, if you were with a raptor, usually they're by themselves, but if, with parrots, they form family groups. So they kind of see us as family members, and that's the reason why they come back to us too. So we do this flyover twice a day. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic thing to come out and see. I mean, we do it at 10, 15, and 2 o'clock, right? And of course, weather permitting, because we won't fly them if there's a thunderstorm out here. So when you're at the zoo, try to arrange your time to where you can come to the front of the zoo and see this flyover. It's phenomenal. with Dan, one of our animal care managers, and we're in our Puerto Rican crested toad breeding facility. Uh, and this is an endangered species that we've been part of the reintroduction of this animal back into its native range. So, Dan, uh, what do you, who you got in your hand right here? I've got a Puerto Rican crested toad in my hand yeah, right here. Not the most uh, handsome toad in the world, but no. certainly a critically endangered species. Yes, uh, not very handsome. Uh, how, many have, how many do we have, roughly? Roughly we have oh, uh, about 15 on ground, 15, okay. some on display, some back here for breeding purposes. So as in the breeding plan, we have to separate the species from the other toads, right, as yes. far as the reintroduction. So uh, you hold a record in our zoo right now for the number of animals released into the wild. So how many toads did we send down this year to Puerto Rico? 1,687. 1,687, and how did we do that? How did the, how were they packaged? How did they transfer? Well, we just put them in big plastic bags, mm -hmm. uh, put them in a cooler uh, with some cold packs, and put them on a UPS truck or a FedEx truck okay. and send them over. So we coordinated this with uh, uh, how many other zoos were part of this release? Um, there were three other zoos part of this release okay. this time. So probably what, then about five, six thousand, seven thousand toads probably went down to Puerto Rico yes. and as part of this release. Now, you know, you'll, you'll have some losses obviously in this transfer and that's taken yeah. into consideration. But but again, so so it doesn't take a lot of space, it doesn't take a lot of room to help endangered species. And how many aquarium do you, do you have in this room? We have, well, what you see here? Well, it's about, about 10, a, yeah, yeah. 10 or, 10 and or 12. Two breeding tanks that are upside down right now because so, we're not breeding at the time. So, actually, a pretty small facility, but we can do a great deal and make a huge impact 
uh, with a species that's in big trouble in Puerto Rico right now. So, so Dan, you've been doing this for a while. Is, is the outlook better now for the toads? It is better. Um, the site that we uh, released our tadpoles uh, at, uh, they found uh, 25 adult males and two adult females, uh, which is not unusual from a release back in 2013. Wow. So wow. it is helping. It is okay. helping. And this is all a result of the chytrid virus, right? Is this the thing this that's is, caused? With these guys, it's more of a habitat loss habitat and pollution. Loss. Okay. Because okay. you have to remember, this is truly the canary in the coal mine. When, when frogs and toads come down with issues or show issues in the environment, they're usually the first ones that will signal us that we've got a problem. And, and so we need to pay attention to it biologically. Um, they'll let us know that we either have highly polluted environments or whatever might be going on. So they help us as humans and biologists understand what might be going on in the uh, in the environment. So this is a full adult you have in your this hand. This is right? a full adult. looks like a male to me. Looks like a male. Wow. Yeah. So here you again, folks. Uh, this is all done behind the scenes. All the, the work, uh, the hard work for conserving the species is done behind the scenes. And Lowry Park is part of a release of these animals back into their native habitat. You can enjoy this species also uh, on exhibit in our uh, in our herb collection. So next time you're at the zoo, stop by and take a look at the Puerto Rican crested toads. So I'm with Julie, animal care manager for the aviary, and uh, Julie, who do we have here? We have a pair of violaceous taraco fledglings. Um, they're about 45, one is 45, one's 46 days old, so a little over six weeks old. And um, they had, they were actually, <laughs> we have a pair in the Ow. aviary, this is actually their chicks. Ow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would you like me to get him? Hey. <laughs> so you just saw pictures of the adults. They're just spectacular birds. The coloration is, is just incredible. So believe it or not, these guys will look that beautiful and, and pretty short order, right? They'll, uh, how long will it take it them to get there? It will take them about three to five months to get the color on the head. Okay. They're already getting the ir iridescent purple color on their feathers, but the, the red feathers on the head and the yellow um, on yeah. their bill is going to take three to six months. So this is a first for us, right? It is a first. Yeah. Very exciting. Um, we pulled the eggs because the eggs were in kind of a, the nest was in a, what we considered a dangerous yeah. position in a tree and the weather has been so bad that we were a little concerned yeah. for the welfare of the eggs. So we pulled them and incubated them from day two and um, hatched these beautiful, beautiful yeah, we, birds out. We chronicled the raising of these birds uh, with uh, pictures and video. It's just incredible to see how far they've come in such a short period of time. And Taracos are beautiful birds in general, but I think this species certainly is, is significant. Where does this uh, Taraco range typically? They're in we Western Africa. Western Africa. Yes, okay. and they have a wide range of habitats, savannas, forests. Um, they even can be found in parks in that area as well. Yeah. And I'm sure the, uh, <laughs> uh, if you have the opportunity to be in their rangeland, this coloration when they fly, uh, the underwings are, are red, is that right? They have a, a very, so I mean you can see them in the forest, in the green forest, it's just fantastic when you watch, uh, again, most Taracos, very colorful birds, but this one, there you see some of the red starting to come in. So this is a great accomplishment for the uh, aviary department. You, and you'll see the adults in the, uh, the walkthrough aviary when you first come in the zoo on your right, and then we'll be incorporating these chicks in other aviaries uh, throughout the zoo as they mature. So again, a, another first for Lowry Park and uh, a lot of work uh, for the aviary. A lot of work. Two um, feedings from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. every two hours for the first week and then every other every week we would go down a feeding and down an hour. Um, but completely worth every second of it. A great learning experience for my team and I. I tell you, it's a, so what's the bird eating right now? What's the food called? It's called the, the pellet, the yellow that you see is a soft bill pellet and it's softened just a little bit. When they're adults, they'll, they'll eat it regularly. It'll be a hard pellet. But just to make it easier for them to eat and digest, we put a little water on it. They get a variety of fruits, papaya, melons, um, grapes, blueberries, apples. And in the wild, they're mostly fruity eaters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. 
So again, in the wild, seasonally, they'll follow fruiting trees and so on and so forth to keep their, their diets robust. So again, a, a great first for the zoo, and, and you can come see them in the main aviary. I'm with Brittany and we're at the Goat Amphitheater and behind us is the Goat Show. Uh, Brittany has been part of the training of this, uh, this particular event we have here. So Brittany, tell us about some of the interesting stories in training these goats for these behaviors. Uh, well, they started only in about February, really working on the show. So we did have to train all the behaviors from pretty much scratch. So that was exciting for us to try and find a way to teach the goats. Um, but uh, surprisingly, it only took probably a week for most behaviors to get trained into them. Uh, so even the spins, we used target balls and uh, just shaped the behavior. So it was a lot of fun for us and it gave us some good experience to work with our goats. Well, it's great. I've, I've come over here to watch this several times and I think the kids enjoy it more than anything else because it's, it's very cool what they've taught these goats to do. And as you just saw, we also have the, the horse parade or the parade that we do. Uh, we take the horses down to the front of the zoo from Wallaroo and back up again. And it's just a great, I think it's a great experience for the kids to get close to the horses. And here, of course, they're very close to the goats. So tell us some of the interesting or cute stories that you've had trying to train these guys. Um, Probably the cutest is trying to first start off the behaviors and they want to really please you. So if any behavior they already know, they'll offer it and offer it and offer it. Um, so you're like, oh, I wish I could reward you, but I'm actually asking you to do something else right now. And so it takes them a little bit of time um, and they are so willing to help us participate and they'll run up and they call to us when we walk into the petting zoo. They're like, I know you, you're my trainer. So. It's really been an awesome bonding experience for us and they are very, they love everybody because we, they know we all kind of have rewards for them, um, but they're individual trainers. They definitely have a special bond. They usually will call to you. So, so what are you uh, rewarding them with? What's the food? Uh, we have several different types of food that we like to feed them. Um, hay cubes and hay pellets are the biggest thing. And then we also give them other special rewards such as kale or romaine and then carrots, apples, and pears tend to be another extra, maybe a little grain on the side. Okay. Well, now, if you remember in past shows, we've talked about our elephant training and some of the other training we do with our rhinos. This is an offshoot of that. It's positive reinforcement. The animal performs the way we want it to or does the behavior, uh, they get a positive reward for that. They get a food treat for that. And, and this is just another version of that. And, and uh, terribly interesting, cute show. I think your family will enjoy it. So next time you're at the zoo, you got to come into Wallaroo Station. If you don't catch that horse parade, be sure to come over and see the goat show. Okay, I'm with uh, Chris, our mammal curator, and we have a bondy buck calf with us that uh, we've been hand-raising. Hand Mother uh, rejected the calf, and a uh, perfectly healthy calf, so we're going to now hand-raise this animal and then release it into a part of our collection. So Chris is about ready to give her her afternoon feeding here. And uh, this is important for several reasons. One, it, it le allows us, obviously, to keep track of the animal, its health, uh, check it over daily. And, uh, you know, she'd be getting milk from mother at this time uh, of day uh, normally. So we just substitute. We're, we're, uh, we're mother at this point. So Chris, uh, it's been one of the first animals we've, we've raised like this. So uh, any challenges with this particular species? Uh, yeah, you can see she's got no problem no uh, getting on the bottle uh, at this point. So she was born uh, end of May. Um, initially, um, you know, it was really about finding the right formula for her, I think was right. the most difficult thing. Right. She took to the bottle um, pretty quickly, and once she locked on, she never looked back. So really making sure we get the right formula for her is, was pretty important. You can see she's still <laughs> pretty hungry here. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. 
Okay. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> she says, no, I'm not done with this one yet. Hang on a second. So uh, how many times a day are we giving her a bottle now? Uh, so we're starting the weaning process. We're getting her off the bottle. So she's down to about three feedings a day. Initially, it was about five feedings. Uh, pretty okay. soon, we'll move her to about two. Um, and uh, just during working hours now, too, which is nice, because we were here a little later, giving her a late bottle to uh, take her through the night. Uh, so, and then we'll substitute the, the reduced bottles with uh, pelleted food and hay and so on and so forth, right? Yeah, so she's taken really well um, to the grain that we give her, the pelleted food, mm -hmm. uh, but also browse. Um, she does a little grazing out here in the yard and certainly uh, uh, some hay as well. Now, now, this species was at one time very common in South Africa, and <clears throat> some of the historical files indicate it got down to 17 animals, if that's it's hard to comprehend at one time, because of overhunting, a good food source, uh, certainly in the uh, late 1800s in South Africa. Now the animal's being farmed, and the, and the population's come back again quite nicely. In fact, uh, any hunting that goes on with this animal is really just to keep the population in check. Uh, and it was, I believe, the first endangered species uh, listed internationally uh, at one time because the numbers were so, so, uh, so low. So now, if you go to Africa, you'll see these in very large herds in the managed parks, and they're beautiful animals. Uh, have a mottled coat, uh, and they'll run in very large herds typically, and you typically see them also with zebras. So this is an opportunity for us to practice our skills with, uh, with hand raising. Uh, it's not that uncommon in our industry when we have a parental neglect case like this that, you know, we have to intercede. Again, a perfectly healthy animal, it's going to be viable in the population at some time. Now, there are challenges, obviously, with a hand-raised animal uh, because, uh, as you can see, she's not afraid of us at all. So wh however she ends up in her, uh, her adult population, wherever she ends up, there will be some challenges in introducing her. So, uh, Chris, we'll be putting her, uh, what, in Wild Africa? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and exhibit her in the uh, Wild Africa set section where we have a, a mixed species exhibit, right. other antelope species in there, greater kudu, uh, hopefully exhibiting lechwe there as right, well soon. Right, right. Um, but the, you know, the delicate balance is, is making sure she's aware that she's a bonobuck. Right. Um, so we didn't want to spend too much time with her. Obviously all our interactions with her are very positive. The bottle feeding is something she really wants. Um, but outside of that, her normal interactions, we wanted to give her with other animals. Right. Um, so we have given her other companionship in here outside of human contact as well too. So she's not, she's going to be imprinted for right, sure. Right, um, right. But hopefully she'll interact well with other animals as well too. So we uh, we house the female bonnie buck with a goat. This is a companion animal. This is oftentimes uh, used in our managed population. So it gives the animal uh, a companion nighttime companion, whatever, and you don't, that way the animal stays much calmer uh, throughout its formative years. And, and goats are great because uh, they pretty much can put up with anything. So if she has, runs around, starts button heads or whatever, the goat's okay with that. It doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't bother them. So many goats uh, have filled this important role of being the companion for a hand-raised animal. So, you know, we'll slowly step away from this contact, and as Chris said, there, there are going to be challenges, but, but again, a, a, an animal that might be able to contribute to the genetic pool at some time. So, uh, in the future, you're going to see this uh, female bonnie buck uh, on exhibit when you uh, take the tram around in, on Wild Safari. Thank you for joining us. As you can see, there's always something new and exciting going on at the zoo. So join us next time on Wildlife at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo.